Hello, I'm Lisa Carrico, Director of Family and Veteran Programs for the Missouri Humanities. We are a member-supported organization, and our mission is to connect Missourians to the people, places, and ideas that shape society. Today, we embark on Chapter 6 of our virtual storytelling journey that brings the book, Growing Up with the River, Nine Generations on the Missouri to Life. Growing Up with the River by Dan and Connie Burkhart explores our state's rich cultural heritage through the eyes of nine generations of children growing up in river towns along the Missouri River. Each of the 10 chapters will be presented by professional storytellers and special guests. The series will run every Wednesday at 4 p.m. on Facebook Live, ending on September 30th. Today, we will explore Washington, Missouri. The year is 1932, even though the country was in the Great Depression, the Missouri River was creating activity in Washington, both on the river and in its busy downtown. Projects to tame the flooding of the river were underway and the construction on the city's first bridge across the Missouri was about to begin. A few miles east in Gray Summit, the countryside provided a refuge for a valued orchid collection from St. Louis. Today's chapter will be presented by former art teacher and professional storyteller, January Kiefer. January has a deep love of the arts and nature. She grew up in Vienna, Austria, and both her parents were immigrants, one from Germany and one from the island of Jamaica. She is grateful for many opportunities. She's had to teach, write, perform, preach, paint, and tell stories. And after narrating today's chapter, she'll reveal a little bit about her own German roots. After January's reading, we will introduce our special guest for this chapter. Special thanks to the Burkharts for writing such an engaging book and for entrusting us to share the stories within, and to artist Brian Haynes for allowing us to share his beautiful book images. And as uh, a quick congratulatory, congratulatory shout out to Brian for being featured on the cover of the September, October 2020 issue of the Saturday Evening Post. We'll add a link in the comment section. Please let us know that you're watching by asking questions and leaving comments. In partnership with the Higher Education Channel HEC TV, the St. Louis Storytelling Festival, Missouri History Museum, Magnificent Missouri, we present Growing Up with the River. Thank you so much, Lisa. It's just lovely to be here. One of the many things that I enjoy about this book is that every single chapter has a family in it. There are children and parents and grandparents in every chapter. And it's interesting that none of them are given names. I actually like that because that means that when you read the book, you can give them whatever names you like. And I think that is a lot of fun. So let's begin the reading of chapter six. The children raced around the yard in a game of cops and robbers. And since she was the littlest and the easiest to catch, she was always a robber. Jail was their front porch. It was fun to be thrown in jail. Rescue me, she yelled to the other robbers who tried to sneak over and pull her off the porch before the cops could see. Then she saw two hobos coming down the street. So she yelled, Mama, the hobos are here. The hobos need you. And she went crashing into the house to look for her mother and for food to give away. This was the depression and there were many men without work. Oftentimes the men would travel from town to town looking for work. Traveling workers were called hobos. They were always glad for any kind of work they could find. And when they couldn't find work, they were really glad if someone was kind enough to offer them some food or even a cup of coffee. A couple of years ago, 
Someone had come to the girl's back door for the first time asking for food. Hobos and tramps came to town on the train. Dozens of them would scramble off the train when it slowed to a halt on the riverfront. Sometimes the sheriff would encourage them, move on to the next stop along the railroad. There's no work here. Move on, move on. One day when father was at home, he felt really bad for a young hobo who came by the house and he gave him 25 cents. Go down to the Silver Spoon Cafe on Elm Street, he told him, and buy yourself a piece of apple pie. Father knew that he himself was one of the lucky ones because he still had his job at the corn cob pipe factory downtown where huge piles of corn cobs went in one side of the old building and corn cob pipes of all sizes came out the other. The problem was that most people didn't have any work. Opa, that's grandpa in German, Opa said it was hard to find a job. There weren't many jobs in their town for the people who lived there, let alone the endless stream of hobos who came through. Like all of their neighbors, Opa was certain that prohibition was a bad idea. Prohibition had started in 1922, 10 years before. And during Prohibition, you were not allowed to make, buy, or sell liquor. That meant no beer, no wine. That was bad news for the people living along the Missouri River Valley because a lot of them had vineyards. There was even a brewery in the town of Washington. But the brewery and the wineries had to close down. And all the people who worked there lost their jobs. Opa hoped prohibition would soon end so that the Brush Brewery could reopen and men could start working there again. The girl's family had moved into Washington to get away from their family farm and the problems caused by the Missouri River. They loved their farm, but my goodness, her grandparents had been grumpy ever since they left. But the river had flooded their farm so many times and not long before they moved, one of their barns had even been swept away in a flood. Father said, I am not going to plant another crop on land that is just going to get flooded. And I am not going to build another barn and then watch it go floating down the river. When the grown-ups talked about serious things like this, they still spoke in German. It's important to remember that the girl's great-grandparents had come all the way from Germany to live in the United States many years before. And they, like many other German people, they settled along the Missouri River Valley. They were learning English, but because they already knew German, they had German newspapers and they had German schools and they wanted to keep their own German language going strong. But then there was a war, and in that war, the United States and Germany were enemies. And so in the United States, you were not allowed to speak German in public anymore. The German newspapers closed down, the German schools closed down, and German was not taught the way it had been before. The little girl in our story she loved German though, and she loved learning words and sayings from her Oma, her grandmother, and her Opa, her grandpa. She knew lots of words. One thing for sure she knew how to say was, Mehr Kuchen bitte, Oma. That means more cake, please, Grandma. 
And of course, Oma would always give her another piece of cake and a great big hug. It seemed like everyone was mad about the floods because they lost so much after working so hard. But now things were happening that were supposed to make the river more civilized and stop all that flooding. Opa and father took her brothers to watch the work being done along the river and they were all fascinated by the big willow mats the men were building. Enormous rafts of cut willow saplings were floated to the side of the river and dozens of men wove them together like a big basket and then covered them with large rocks. Huge pieces of equipment on barges scooped mud from the riverbank to send the water in different directions. It looked like something the boys would do in their backyard after it got all muddy in a hard rain. But this was so much bigger. Their parents talked about the levees that were being built in the river bottom on the north side of the river and promised to take the ferry across the river to see them. It seemed like a very good thing, preventing the river from flooding and giving the men jobs working on all these projects. Oma and Opa really missed the farm, but mother said, I'm happy to live in town and have nearby neighbors. Father missed the farm too. He missed his field work and his cows and his hogs, but he was always ready to take their old Model T Ford on Sunday drives. Just yesterday, they took the new concrete road from Washington to Gray Summit and then went all the way to Head Store in St. Albans for a sandwich. It was a very long, hot ride, but it was worth it. Near Gray Summit, the Ralston Purina Farm was one of their favorite places to visit. It was a perfect farm in every way. There were neat pastures fenced by board fences. And father said, the very best part, it is not in a floodplain. No flooding here. On their next Sunday drive, they were going to take the new road to Gray Summit again, this time to see thousands of orchids. Mother tried to draw an orchid for her daughter in order to describe it to her. These beautiful, colorful flowers usually grew in the jungle or in Florida, but now they were only a few miles from Washington. They had been growing at the Missouri Botanical Garden in St. Louis City, but there was so much coal smoke and smog happening in the city that some of the plants especially the orchids that were growing there, were dying. The girl had seen pictures in the newspaper of plants that were dying from the smoke compared to healthy plants of the same kind. It made her very sad. So the Missouri Botanical Garden had bought a large piece of land a few years earlier and moved the orchids and some of the other plants there. The country air was clean and pure and just right for the orchid collection. In addition to all of the excitement of a new bridge and the work on the river, there were now beautiful tropical orchids growing nearby. Sunday drives were always special, but most of the time the family walked. They walked to church, to school, to the bakery, and to City Hall, where Mother and Oma could register to vote for the first time in history. Women were not allowed to vote in America until 1920, when the 19th Amendment was finally ratified. Just think, that was a hundred years ago this very year. And this is an important year to be voting too, 
So I hope everybody in your family who can vote does so. Mother and Oma joked about the fact that now that they were voting, we were going to get a bridge across the Missouri River instead of just relying on the ferry because women had started to vote and to help make the decisions. But what was their favorite walk of all? Not to the bakery, not to City Hall. It was to the Calvin Movie Theater, not far from their house. The children begged to see the mummy. We want to see the mummy. But their parents said, mm, that might give you bad dreams. So they settled for Tarzan the Ape Man. That movie made them want to live in the jungle. It looked a little like the land along the river, but with monkeys and elephants. And for a long time after seeing that movie, instead of playing cops and robbers, the children played Tarzan the Ape Man. The girls' grandparents didn't like the movie theater too much, though. They said it was nothing compared to the Wonderland floating theater, a boat that floated from one river town to the next, sounding its big calliope. That's kind of like an organ when it came to town. Actors actually lived on the boat, presenting plays and musical performances. Oma said, that they sometimes even asked the locals to come up on stage and join them in the play. The Wonderland sounded wonderful. Wunderbar, that's the German word for wonderful. With parents and grandparents who told so many stories, the girl often wished that she had lived in Washington long ago. She wished that she had seen a river boat full of actors and musicians pull into town. She wished that she had seen the forests brimming with deer and turkey before they had all been killed by hunters. She wished that everyone still spoke in German. She started to sniffle a little bit. And she said to Oma, I miss the good old days. That made Oma chuckle. Oma said, my liebes Kind, that means my dear child. You live in exciting times. You live in America. My mother and father came to America for progress and opportunity. And there is so much of that here. Just think how fortunate we are that my parents decided to come here to leave the old country before I was even born. Today, yes, we wish there were more jobs, but our lives here are good even so. In the old country, the problems are much, much worse. Here, we can take drives into the beautiful countryside. We can save our pennies and go to the new movie theater. And best of all, your father still has his job at the factory. There's plenty of progress right here in Washington. We are lucky to be in America at this time. Before long, we'll have a bridge to cross the river and there will be many men working to build that bridge. Can you believe it, little one? We will be able to drive the car on a road high over the river. The girl thought about that and she decided Oma was right. The new bridge would be exciting. This was a great time to be growing up on the Missouri River in Washington, Missouri, in the United States of America. 
she was lucky to be born in this country and to live in a place where she had the best of the old country and the best of the new. I hope you enjoyed listening to chapter six of this wonderful book. You know, I share something with all of the people in that book. I have German roots too. My dad was born in Germany, but he came over to the United States with his parents when he was a little boy. After he grew up and married and started a family of his own, his job took him back overseas. And then we lived in Vienna, Austria. That's where I grew up. Now, Austria is not in Germany, but it is right next door. And it is also a German speaking country. Many, many times I went with my family across the border into Germany to our old family home of Ettlingen where my great grandfather had built a house. There was always one thing that I wanted to see for sure when we went to visit that big old house. It was a teddy bear. There was a big brown teddy bear that sat on the top step in the hallway. And I wanted to see that teddy bear. When I did, I always felt welcome. Maybe you can see that teddy bear right behind me. That big brown bear, that's the bear that was in my great grandfather's house. The bear in front of it, the blonde bear, is the bear that my parents gave to me when I was a little girl. And I'm pretty sure you can see how ragged it is. That's because I loved that bear so much when I was a little girl. I pretty much kissed the hair right off that bear. Now there's something about those bears that's kind of special. Yes, they are German bears. They were both made in Germany. They were made by the Steiff Toy Company. But if you remember last week when the Burkharts were reading to you from chapter five, they mentioned the St. Louis World's Fair that happened in 1904. Well, guess what? The Steiff Toy Company had an exhibit at the St. Louis World's Fair. And they even won the grand prize. People loved those Steiff bears so much, they bought 12,000 Steiff bears. So there is a connection between the Steiff Toy Company and my bears and St. Louis and Missouri. It's almost time for me to say goodbye and for our next guest to come and talk with you. But I would like to introduce you to one more member of the Steiff family. It's not a bear. It's a little puppet. It's a leopard. Hallo, wie geht es? That means, how are you? Ich bin ganz gut. Wie geht es mit dir? I'm good too. Thank you very much. Say, little leopard, Steif, could you help me translate a few words? of English into German, since you are a German steif leopard. Aber natürlich, that means naturally. Well, how do you say thank you in German? Danke. Danke. How do you say please in German? Bitte. Oh, yeah, I remember when the girl says, Mehr Kuchen bitte, Oma. Yeah, I remember that. Tell me one more thing, though. How do you say, Yeah, how do you say, I love you in German? Ich 
Liebe dich! Oh! I love you too, little leopard puppet. I've had you for a long time. I think it's time for us to go now. So let's say one more thing. Can we say goodbye in German? How do you say that? Auf Wiedersehen. Thank you so much, January, for the great narration and for sharing your personal story with us and teaching us some German words today. Uh, it is with great honor to introduce our two guests for today. Our first guest, Peter H. Raven, is the president emeritus of the Missouri Botanical Garden and George Engelman Professor of Botany for Washington University. Dr. Raven is a world leading botanist and recipient of the National Medal of Science. And today he will discuss the smog problem that forced the Missouri Botanical Gardens to move its orchid collection from St. Louis to Shaw Nature Reserve. Following Dr. Raven's presentation, we'll have a musical performance by Shane Forth and Envy from the band Ziggy and the Neptunes. Shane is a local Kansas Cityan and is the music director of Quick's Toxic since the group's inception in 2006, he has performed all over the world with them. He enjoys sharing his passion for all kinds of music by performing and directing shows for audiences of all ages. And Envy is a part of that band. Uh, she is a vocalist and she has performed over 300 shows since joining them in 2017. She is Cuban born and lived in Miami, Florida until last year when she moved to Kansas City. So welcome to Missouri. And together they'll be performing their version of Big Rock Candy Mountain. It's amazing to uh, think about all the many people who came to St. Louis and to Missouri from all over the world and the wonderful story of the German settlers we just heard was a very fine example of that. The Missouri Botanical Garden, affectionately called Shaw's Garden, was started by an English immigrant in 1859. It's the oldest botanical garden in the United States, actually, and uh, a wonderful treasure for the people of St. Louis to enjoy. Now, why were all those orchids there in Gray Summit for the people who lived in Washington, Missouri, to go over and see? Well. It's a long story. The population of St. Louis kept building up and up. There were more and more people here. There were only about 15,000 Native Americans in the state of Missouri before the Europeans got here. When Lewis and Clark got back in 1803, there were about 5,000 people in the entire state. But about a million by the end of the century, the 19th century, the year 1900. And one of the things those people had done in building uh, the St. Louis metropolitan area was to find ways, special ways to heat their houses and run their businesses. And businesses were a big contributor to the smoky episode that I'm about to tell you about. By the end of the 19th century, by the time the World's Fair was coming into being, St. Louis had so much smoke thanks to all the soft coal being burned that was imported from across the river in Illinois and elsewhere, had so much smoke that uh, it was dirty. City Hall looks dirty now. If you've seen it, it has a black smock smushies on it and those have been tried to be cleaned off, but you can still see them there. At the Missouri Botanical Garden in South St. Louis, books inside got all brown and black on as a result of all the day after day after day of coal fire. One of the results of this was that it became more and more difficult as we just heard to grow orchids in the city. And orchids were a big part of the display in the Missouri Botanic Garden, but they were there for another very important purpose. Can you guess what that was? Well, they were used for corsages. They were used for a lovely bouquet of flowers that women, your date, would wear when you took her out. And it was almost mandatory to bring an orchid flower and a corsage when you went out on a date a uh, hundred years ago. 
The result of that was there were no orchids to be flown in from Hawaii or Java or somewhere like that. Uh, there were no orchids to be grown out of doors in St. Louis or in such a cold climate in winter, such a hot one in summer. But orchids were grown in greenhouses like this one. That's the greenhouse at the garden in town. And you could see what a lovely array there are there and the thousands of individual orchids. But it turned out that by a uh, hundred years ago, selling flowers from those orchids was an important source of revenue for the garden. And it needed to go on doing that in order to help support itself. And as the smog, the smoke, the smog as we would call it now, the smoke got thicker and thicker. And actually in um, 1820, and in 1928, the smog was so thick one day that People couldn't see to drive in midday without turning on their car lights. Well, it's got thicker and thicker. It began to kill all the plants in the garden in, Grace, uh, in uh, town in the middle of St. Louis, including the orchids. And they didn't produce their valuable flowers for the corsages that the garden depended on. But fortunately, in 1925, the garden had bought a four, what, what now amounts to four square miles of real estate. Uh, in, in Franklin County, and they figured that they could build greenhouses there, so they went ahead and did that and then moved their orchid collection out there beyond the reach of the devastating smoke that was killing them all in town. And there the orchids grew uh, beautifully, the business went on, and eventually the garden began to think, well, hey, this is so much better a climate than in town that Maybe we ought to move the whole garden out there. But by 1920, uh, by 1939 and the early 40s, by 1941, St. Louis area got their smog, their smoke pollution problem under control, thanks to some enlightened leaders. And they were able to reserve, they were able to keep their garden in town and not move it lock, stock, and barrel out to the country, 30 miles away from its regular main site, but to keep it going where it was. And on the other hand, the four square miles out in the country proved to be a more and more wonderful and valuable piece of land for people to enjoy on its own. Here's a, here's a winter scene in the prairie of a an 1880s house out there that's been restored as a museum. And in the front, you can see the prairie. And, and then here, you can see further scenes at the Gray Summit Nature Reserve, which we now call the Shaw Nature Reserve, a walk over an artificial uh, marshland. And then finally, um, uh, another scene is, is restored prairie. We have about 600 acres of restored prairie in the Gray Summit uh, Shaw Nature Reserve. And that 600 acres represents a remnant of the uh, 70,000, 700,000 acres that originally occurred in Missouri, over a fifth of the whole state, and is a wonderful place to learn and walk and so forth. Therefore, the land in the country that the garden acquired allowed them to save their orchids. And then the land that they acquired allowed them to exhibit the Missouri countryside in a beautiful way for all comers, children, adults to come and enjoy. Another feature of our beautiful development of our natural land along the state shown so well in Dan and Connie Burkhart's book. Thank you. Hey, my name is Shane Worth. Hi, I'm Envy. Uh, a little bit about myself. I've been playing violin since I was four years old. I grew up in a house full of music. I have three younger sisters. We all grew up playing music together. It was really amazing. Um, I played in a few bands in high school and college. I played a lot of Irish music and a lot of American folk music. And I've been singing since I was two, a little bit of everything, and I get to sing in a band with this guy, and they're called Ziggy and the Neptunes, or we're called Ziggy and the Neptunes. We have a cellist that's not here right now, but yeah, I'm super excited to sing this for you today. 
It's great to be here. Thank you to the Missouri Humanities Council for having us. We're really excited to play this song for you guys. We are going to play uh, Big Rock Candy Mountain. It was written by Harry McClintock in 1895, so a long time ago. And the song, he wrote it, well, he was a hobo on a train when he was a young kid. He went from train to train, and he saw a lot of the United States, and he wrote a lot of music while he did that. And this song is inspired by the events of his life um, about... Well, so really, this is folk music, and what makes folk music cool is it tells a story from somebody's perspective, and this is his perspective of his childhood, and the lyrics that he wrote in 1895 are not sung today. Uh, you should check them out someday, maybe, if you're feeling like it, uh, but the, the lyrics changed over time. That happens a lot with folk music. It changes from person to person, because a lot of these songs aren't written down, and so when they're told, when I tell Envy the lyrics to the song, she might hear a couple different words, and then she tells her friend or her child, and they hear, they hear it a different way, and that keeps happening. And so there's been nine generations in Missouri telling these stories through music, and that's what makes that's what makes folk music really interesting and really cool. Um, so I think we should just play them the song and yeah. see what they think. Hope you guys really dig it. everyone that tuned in for our sixth chapter of Growing Up with the River. Thank you, HEC TV, for helping us present this program. Special thanks to our storyteller, January Kiefer, and guest speaker, Dr. Peter H. Avon, Raven, and Ziggy and the Neptunes. If you would like to learn more about the Missouri Botanical Gardens Orchid Show, we will post a video produced by HEC TV in the comment section, along with a Facebook link to Ziggy and the Neptunes. Thanks to everyone who registered in advance for this series. With each chapter, we'll be hosting a little giveaway to folks who have registered. Today, we're giving away a special goodie bag graciously donated by the Missouri Botanical Garden. We will randomly choose a name from the registration list to receive the book in the mail. If you would like to receive series updates, including links to videos, fun book activities, and raffle prizes, visit mohumanities.org. Um, Missouri's rich German heritage is highlighted in this chapter and throughout the book. Uh, for this week's activity, we um, are giving you all the opportunity to learn German at home. So please do enjoy. We will link the activity below. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, we will see you later, and we hope we'll see you next week for Chapter 7. <laughs>